New America would like to welcome you to our virtual event. The program will begin momentarily. While we are waiting, I want to review a few housekeeping notes. This event is being recorded and a recording will be posted to the New America events page within 48 hours after the event. Attendees will be in listen only mode and you will not be able to be seen or heard by your fellow attendees or panelists. Therefore, we encourage you to share your comments and questions in the Q&A features, which can be found at the bottom of the screen. Thank you for joining us. We will begin momentarily. New America would like to welcome you to our virtual event. The program will begin momentarily. While we are waiting, I want to review a few housekeeping notes. This event is being recorded and a recording will be posted to the New America events page within 48 hours after the event. Attendees will be in listen only mode and you will not be able to be seen or heard by your fellow attendees or panelists. Therefore, we encourage you to share your comments and questions in the Q&A features, which can be found at the bottom of the screen. Thank you for joining us. We will begin momentarily. Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome uh, to New America's and Future Tenses, Future Tenses event on Do We Need uh, a First Amendment 2.0? I'm Anne Marie Slaughter. Uh, the CEO of New America, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you and uh, starting a conversation uh, with Jeffrey Stone, whom I'm going to introduce in just a minute. Uh, I'll, we will have a broader conversation than First Amendment uh, for about 15 minutes, and then we will hand off uh, to the first panel. So Jeffrey Stone is a very distinguished writer, lawyer, thinker, for me, uh, I met him when he was Dean of the University of Chicago Law School back in 1990, well, actually in 1989. Uh, he was my Dean when I first started teaching uh, and he has been uh, a mentor and a friend uh, and a colleague. And it's, it's wonderful to be able to talk to him uh, in this guise and in any guise. He is also uh, the Edward H. Levy Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Chicago Law School. He was the provost of the University of Chicago. Uh, he has, has taught a wide range of courses and written many books. <laughs> and I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, but his most recent one uh, is, uh, the, is Democracy and Equality, the Enduring Constitutional Vision of the Warren Court, which I think is, is particularly important uh, right now. So Jeff, welcome, uh, and it's great to have you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. It's great to see you and great to be here. So I, I do want to pull the lens back a little bit to get started. We're asking about a First Amendment 2.0. You have written extensively on the First Amendment 1.0. And now we're really talking about much more fundamental changes. I mean, hate speech, regulating hate speech, things that at least for my generation of lawyers were just out of bounds. I mean, you know, that was what Europe, Europe did. That wasn't what we did. We're also talking about packing the Supreme Court. And your colleague and mine, Larry Kramer, a former dean of the Stanford Law School, president of the Hewlett Foundation, just wrote something in the New York Times basically recommending changing the number of justices on the court. These are, to me, really big changes. They're, they're not revolutions, but they are way more than reforms. So I'd love to hear what you think about what 
scope of change we need uh, or that we're likely to have, whether you want to prescribe or, 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 or predict. Uh, but, but as someone who has been a reformer all your life, do we need really sort of fundamental rethinkings? Well, there's a lot of issues that you address there. Um, I'll take a look at two of them. Um, one is on the question of the Supreme Court. Um, I think there are two reasons why uh, progressives, um, and I include myself in that group, um, are thinking seriously about uh, increasing the number of justices on the Supreme Court at this moment. Um, one of them, I think, is the sense that uh, the, the current makeup of the court with six extreme conservatives, six justices who are more conservative than any other justice who has served on the court in almost the last century, with the exception of Antonin Scalia, um, is a complete distortion of what a Supreme Court should be. And you mentioned the, the book I recently published about the Warren Court, and it set forth the Warren Court as a model for what a court should be. And I won't try to explain all that here, but it's a completely different entity than the current makeup of the court. And so one, one reason why people are upset and concerned is simply that this Supreme Court is almost surely not going to fulfill the responsibilities, obligations, and mission that the framers intended the Supreme Court to serve. And therefore, it will do a lot of harm and it needs to be re-examined. Second argument, a more narrow one, um, is that uh, Mitch McConnell has utterly distorted and abused the confirmation process in a way that has intentionally created a court with now a six to three majority of very conservative justices. When if he had acted in a normal, responsible manner in accord with the norms of the confirmation process, Merrick Garland would have been confirmed and Barrett might also have been confirmed had Garland been confirmed and we would have a court now with a 5-4 conservative majority instead of a 6-3 majority. And that in that situation, we should correct the abuse that McConnell has inflicted upon our nation and on the court, and therefore add two seats appointed by presumably President Biden, uh, so that there would be a 6-5 to five still conservative majority on the court, but to put the court back essentially to where it would have been and McConnell not completely abuse his authority. Those are both difficult and complicated issues that need to be addressed in a serious manner. In terms of your other larger issue, um, I, I think the advent of social media has had a profound effect on public discourse in this nation. And we do need to step back and think about, are there ways in which it should be regulated so as to ensure that it does not distort the basic premises of the First Amendment. And this is similar in an important way to what happened in the 1920s and 30s. Um, when radio came into existence, um, Congress was deeply concerned that this would have a similar effect on public discourse and that there were only a couple of frequencies or channels available in any given geographical area and that a rich person could go and buy them on the market and completely dominate public discourse in a city like New York or Chicago or Philadelphia or whatever. And the members of Congress were concerned about this. They saw this as potentially completely corrupting the premises of freedom of speech under the First Amendment. And so they then moved into that they created the Federal Communications Commission and eventually adopted the Fairness Doctrine and basically took the view that the government has to oversee the functioning of radio and then later television. And people have to have licenses that are governed by the Federal Communications Commission. And they have to abide by a fairness doctrine, which provides that they have to provide fair and balanced um, coverage of different perspectives. And that actually has worked very well. Um, and I don't, I'm not suggesting that's the necessary model for social media, but it is an example of the fact that when we faced a similar dilemma, we actually addressed it in a very successful way. Right now, we don't know how to do this. And one of the things we are concerned about is giving government too much power. Right. Because 
the one thing we should never do is trust government to control public discourse. Um, and that that is, by the way, what the Congress did when they adopted the Federal Communications Commission. And that one actually worked out remarkably well. But we still have to be very cautious about going again back in that direction. So, so it's, it's a huge challenge. So I note in both of your examples, A, you, you have the, the basic view that we can maintain the overall frame of separation of powers, of the, the frame of the Constitution, and just keep updating it. Uh, to meet contemporary challenges. Those could be techno technological challenges, they could be abuse of power challenges, uh, but you're, you're sort of saying, look, it, we've got a framework and we've done this before uh, and it works. Uh, and I'm assuming in that, that you would have said the same thing for the Lautner court, which is which, which of course, ultimately uh, Roosevelt did threaten to pack and did change its ways. But I also hear you saying there's some enduring principles that the principle in the Supreme Court has to be that it is not a political body, that there, it, is, it is balanced in a way that law, legal reasoning, legal precedent, uh, the tools of our trade can work. And similarly in the First Amendment, that we don't want government uh, controlling speech that, that we, and that there is a, is a balance. Is that right, that there's sort of enduring principles and a framework, but within that there's a lot of room? Uh, yes, and, and with respect to the Supreme Court, let me just spell out a little bit um, what my views are and, and expressed in the Warren Court in the book. The, a key challenge in constitutional law is when should justices be relatively aggressive in evaluating the constitutionality of laws, and when should they be relatively passive and restrained? The best answer to that question, which really goes back to Madison and Jefferson, is that democracy is a very good system of government, but it's imperfect. And the whole reason for creating courts with judicial review and having a Bill of Rights in the Constitution is recognizing that democracy can go off the rails, and you need some entity to put a check on that. And ju judges and justices with life tenure, who are not to, to be responsive to the majority and have an independence, should be the ones who put a check on that. Then the question is, when is that check most needed? And the answer is basically in two situations, which the framers understood. First, um, a danger of democracy is that the majority will disadvantage, discriminate against, be indifferent to the other people who they simply do not relate to, do not identify with, and may be hostile to, whether it's African-Americans or women or gays or people accused of crime, that you cannot trust the majority in a democracy to be fair-minded with respect to those groups in society with whom they cannot identify and indeed may be hostile to. And you need courts to step in when the law does that and to put a check on it. Right. And the second thing is you cannot trust a, a majority when it comes to regulating the political and electoral process. They will be sorely tempted to manipulate that process to ensure that they remain in control. And so you need courts again to step in in that circumstance. Now the Warren Court exemplified both of those values. What the Warren Court did was to be restrained except basically in those two situations. And as a consequence, they made this a much better democracy and a much better society. The problem with the current justices in the majority is that they don't buy this at all. Um, there is in fact no principle that guides their decision-making. We don't have time to talk about originalism, but it's not coherent. And it does not in fact dictate or reflect their views. Unfortunately, the justices in the majority of this court are political conservatives and if you want to predict how they will vote in the most ideologically divisive cases, ask yourself what the Republican Party would like, and you will predict their votes in 80 to 90 percent of the time. And that's devastating for the integrity of the Supreme Court. And it's a challenge we face going forward that really goes to the very heart of our democracy. So, so I agree with you. Um... I guess the, the so the the follow up question would be 
how we draw that line between when we say it's a political decision rather than a judicial decision, when you and I both know, and you're, you're in Chicago, I started there, Carl Llewellyn and the Bramble Bush, we all know that politics influences how you interpret your, your, your values. It's not necessarily your politics, but your values determine your politics in many ways. Uh, and so we know that you can't pull politics out completely but you're still saying to me, there's a difference between a judge who votes according to the president who appointed him or her and a judge who is trying hard to be as neutral uh, as possible and, and call the law as he or she sees it. Yes, I mean, if you take, if the current justices, for example, honestly and rigorously applied originalism, a theory that I think is nonsense, but if they, did it in a principled and rigorous way, I would say, okay, at least they were being principled, but they're not. And that's what concerns me most. Um, and sometimes they're aggressive, campaign finance, guns, affirmative action, all unconstitutional, right? But uh, gerrymandering, which benefits Republicans, no, that's okay, right? Um, and I, I just think that basically what you see with these justices is the politicization of the court in a way that turns it away from being a principled body and into being a truly illegitimate body. And as someone who spent my entire career studying constitutional law, I find this, this devastating in terms of our constitutional and our legal system. Well, uh, I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, it, it is bomb for my soul to hear, to have a conversation about principle at all. Uh, and the idea of the underlying principle that uh, must guide our interpretation of the law, even as we differ hugely. But there's a difference between principled difference and straight political partisan difference. Uh, I would love to be able to hear the rest of the conversation. Sadly, I can't, but all of you can. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to Professor Jennifer Daskal, uh, who is going to introduce the next panel uh, and probably tell you a little bit about the Free Speech Project as well. So Professor Daskal. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and, and thank you, Anne-Marie, and um, thanks for this great discussion so far. Um, we are now going to um, turn more directly into a discussion of um, does the First Amendment need an update? This is part of a um, year-long free speech project, which is a collaboration between the Tech Law and Security Program at American University, where I teach and work, and um, Future Tense, which is itself a collaboration of Slate, um, New America, and ASU. And over the course of the year, we have curated um, a range of content on the questions of whether and to what extent um, free speech is being challenged in the new digital age um, and had a series of events. And I have been really looking forward to this one for a very long time. So I'm actually really thrilled um, to have this amazing discussion. Um, for those of you who have just tuned in, um, we have two fabulous panelists for this discussion. Jeff Stone, who needs no introduction, um, First Amendment scholar, expert, author of a gazillion different books, um, including um, the editor of a First Amendment casebook. Um, so really perfect expert to um, be talking to us today. And Sierra torres Balesi, who is a professor at Stetson University, um, also the author of too many articles to, to count, um, but has um, a really fabulous 2019 book called Platform Brands, which we will talk about today as well. Um, before we get to that, I wanna just start by asking the big framing question. So we are in a world in which we are inundated by harmful speech, misinformation, disinformation on the elections, which is in just six days, misinformation and disinformation about health in the wake of a massive pandemic, um, bullying, hate speech, um, all, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and so what does this mean about our basic conception of the First Amendment, or at least the conception of the First Amendment since the 1940s of this concept of a free marketplace of ideas, the best ideas are gonna win out, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Does that premise hold true in today's age? I'm gonna start with Professor Stone. I think the key thing to focus on initially 
in response to a question like that is not the assumption that in a marketplace of ideas, the truth will win out. Hopefully it will more often than it doesn't. But the key question is really, do we trust the government to decide what is truth? And First Amendment jurisprudence is less based upon the assumption that the marketplace of ideas will always produce truth. It's imperfect. All marketplaces are imperfect. The question is, is it better than the alternative? And if the alternative is the government gets to dictate what is truth and what is not truth, then you have to ask, is that a safe state of affairs? And I, th I think that qu the question has to be formulated that way. Um, and there's no doubt that the marketplace of ideas won't always produce truth. Um, it produced slavery. Um, it, it produced um, all sorts of terrible decisions in our history. Uh, the internment of Japanese Americans. Um, and in my view, the prohibition of abortion. Um, all sorts of things have been produced by the marketplace of ideas. Um, so it's not perfect and no one has ever argued that it's perfect. The question is, is it better than the alternative? And that seems to be the central framing question. Do we trust the Trump administration to have the power to decide what is true and what is false? Sarah, what, what's your what's your perspective on that on that question? Sure. Um, so the way you say my name is Chara Torres Spellacy, uh, and one of the things that I dealt with in my book, Political Brands, is what the Roberts Supreme Court is doing under the guise of the First Amendment. So one of the things that they are doing is deregulating corruption. Uh, they are narrowing what counts as corruption, both in campaign finance law and in white collar crime. And they're also uh, facilitating lying. Uh, they did this in the Alvarez case where they basically said that you have a constitutional right to lie as a first amendment right. And then I think they added to that in a recent case uh, called Kelly, which is better known as the Bridgegate case, uh, which was about lying about using the George Washington Bridge for political retribution. And so I am sort of deeply worried that the marketplace of ideas is not catching up with, you know, Russian bots and a president who has earned a bottomless Pinocchio from the Washington Post. So that so so I'm just going to respond to that and 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 you know that raises the question: who who determines what's a lie and what's not a lie? And this gets back to the question uh, that that the, the point that um, Professor Stone made: how do we who who is the right arbiter of that determination? I think that's uh, where it becomes very difficult. But uh, for example. Uh, in a, a case called Susan B. Anthony List, there was a question of a uh, political group, uh, the Susan B. Anthony List, lying about the voting record of a member of Congress who was up for re-election. And when they made that particular lie, it ran afoul of a then extant Ohio statute that said you couldn't lie about the voting record of a politician. And, but what the end result of all of that was the Susan B. Anthony list raising a very Alvarez-like argument that they had a constitutional right to lie. And uh, the Sixth Circuit agreed with them. And so Ohio no longer has that statute to enforce. I think that that type of statute is something that a court could deal with. Courts have to deal with lying, perjury, all of the time. And I think that we are disarming the ability to privilege truth, which I think deserves to be privileged under a reading of the First Amendment, which basically just says, yeah, anything goes. Jeff, what do you think? Do you think, I mean, how, who, how, do, we, how, do, we, how do we arbitrate, determine who's, who's telling the truth and who's lying and and who should be making that determination in, in our modern society? So to the extent we're talking about civil actions where a private plaintiff can sue because of a false statement about them, whether it's defamation or hurts them in other ways, um, I'm more comfortable with that 
than I am with criminal prosecutions where the government decides whom to prosecute. Because again, if you simply ask yourself, if there were a law today that made it a crime to lie about the political uh, actions of um, candidates for public office, it was a federal law, and the Trump administration would decide whom to prosecute and whom not to prosecute, you're inviting a complete distortion of public discourse. But if they're civil actions brought by individuals as candidates, then at least it's not the government who's making the decision about whom to prosecute and whom not to prosecute. So I think one has to think all this through more carefully than we've yet done. Um, and I do think that the, the, the Roberts Court surprisingly went further than it should have with respect to false statements. Um, and we do punish false statements in other contexts. We punish perjury, we punish fraud, um, we punish defamation. So it's not as if we can't do this. So it was a little bit bizarre, I think, that they went as far as they did in this context. Um, but I do think there's reason to be cautious about this when we're talking about criminal prosecutions brought by the government, because I don't trust the government to have that power. So we are, we are having this conversation at the same time that um, Google, Facebook, and Twitter um, CEOs are now currently testifying before Congress about um, Section 230. And I assume um, all the listeners here know Section 230, but just in case um, anybody there's anybody wants a refresher, Section 230 is the provision um, of the Communication Decency Act that basically provides immunity from liability for platforms for the speech of their users, um, to put it simply. Um, and so, um, I was teaching this class recently and one of the students teaching the statute recently and one of the students asked a question which I thought was an interesting way of framing it. Is, is there some argument that section 230 is in any way required by the first amendment? So what would, is, do we think that the first amendment values require something like section 230 for, for, for platforms? Um, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think, Jeff? Um. I don't think so. I think uh, Section 230, newspapers, magazines, radio stations, television stations can all be held liable for allowing people to write um, columns um, that are libelous, for example. Um, and Section 230, I think, was, was truly admirable and well-intentioned at the time it was adopted. The, the vision was that social media um, would be an opportunity for individual citizens to communicate with other individual citizens without an intermediary being under any legal obligation to screen and censor and, and to edit. And the idea was to expand the opportunity that all of us have to reach anybody else who wants to read whatever we have to say or, or listen to whatever we have to say. And that was a very admirable goal and aspiration. Um, but it does it turn out to pose a significant problem um, because it means there's an, a huge amount of material that gets put on social media that would be actionable realistically, um, but it's not gonna be actionable because it's not clear in most instances who's been harmed or whether they've been harmed enough to justify a lawsuit. Um, and so the question is, do we want to put the social media platforms in the position that a newspaper is in, which is to screen everything that you and I post on Facebook because they could be held liable if you and I defame somebody on Facebook. So it's actually a very complicated question. And I think the current solution is not satisfactory. Um, but one can make the view that the government should be in the business or private citizens should be in the business of suing people who put things on social media that are in fact illegal or actionable as a matter of civil law. But the problem is that's, that's problematic also. So we don't have a good solution right now. Um, and I, I think we're gonna find a middle ground at some point down the road, but it's not an easy, an easy problem to solve. Um, we don't really want to have Facebook having to screen every single post that any one of us puts up there because they will be liable if we defame somebody. Um, that, that, that would be crazy from their standpoint. So we have to find some way to, to make this work. And right now, I don't think anybody's figured this out. 
Right. So either either there's, I mean, if, if we got rid of section 230, either that happens or the platforms just say, we're not screening at all because we don't want to be liable. We don't want to be, be viewed as a publisher. And that's not going to be a good solution either if you think about all the harms that are perpetuated online. I mean, I, I think one of the things that sometimes gets lost in this debate is that Facebook is editing posts or taking down posts all of the time. They do it under their community standards. And one of the things that I found really troublesome during the 2020 election is that Facebook took the policy position that they would not apply the community standards that apply to everyone else to paid political ads, which basically empowered political actors to lie over Facebook's huge platform and to impact uh, voters during this election. And at least from my point of view, when you have one candidate who is the bottomless Pinocchio president saying that you're allowed to lie in political ads on Facebook is not a neutral position. I mean, it, it sounds neutral because, oh yeah, the other guy can lie too. But if the other guy has you know, a habit of mostly telling the truth and one has a habit of mostly lying, then there's a liar's dividend. Uh, the liar gets to infect uh, people's Facebook feeds with their mendacity. The problem though, just to be clear again, to, to repeat what I said earlier, is if lying on Facebook in political ads is actionable, then that presumably means the government gets to prosecute people who do this. And the issue then is, what makes you think the government's going to do this in a fair and even-handed way? It just gives the government, whoever's in power at any given time, even greater power to manipulate public discourse because they're only going to prosecute the people who are opposing them who make false statements. That's the that's the problem. Is you need an independent entity to do this, and you, the solution may be to create an independent entity that has to do the, the to make the decisions about whom to prosecute and whom not to prosecute. And then the, and that's kind of what the, the Federal Communications Commission was intended to be. And it may be that we need to create an entity like that, that is independent of any political party, and that has the power to decide whom to prosecute. Um, that would be a plausible solution. Um, I want to remind audience members that um, to please submit questions, um, we will be taking your questions. So, so feel free to, to, to send any questions. But what what is so? What do you think, Tara? What do you think that the that Facebook should have done? What what is the right response? Is was Twitter's response the better response? Just get rid of political ads entirely, or or what is the the right answer here? Well, I think there are a number of solutions. There is the uh, Twitter route uh, that you don't allow for paid political ads during election season. That's one approach. And I think in some ways the Twitter approach is preferable to uh, having millions of uh, Facebook users be exposed to all of this. Uh, and I also sort of object to the double standard. Why can Facebook take my post down because I have misstated something, uh, but they won't take a politician's uh, lies down. Uh, I mean, there are a number of ways to get at this. One is under the campaign finance system. Uh, as written, the federal law is really bad at capturing online communications. Uh, so you could improve the campaign finance laws um, like HR1 does. Uh, you could also have more data privacy laws like Europe does. Um, and then bigger picture, you could use the antitrust laws to make Facebook and Google and other behemoths uh, smaller. So I wanna um, go back to the, to the First Amendment for a second. Um, and, and Jeff, so we have a situation as we've, as we've talked about where the government can't do a lot of what the platforms are being asked to do. Is there a concern about the ways in which platforms are effectively kind of being jawboned and persuaded to take on this content moderation role. They're, you know, this is not the first time that the big CEOs have been hauled before Congress. This is one of, you know, I can't probably can't even count as high enough to the number of times that they've been brought before Congress for some aspect of content on their site 
for which there's concerns, often extraordinarily legitimate concerns. But we have this bizarre situation where government officials are asking these private companies to take actions in ways that the government couldn't do itself because of the First Amendment limitations. And what does that tell us? Should we be concerned about that? Does that tell us something about the First Amendment and our thinking about the First Amendment? How do, how do we make sense of that? Well, that's an interesting point, because in light of the Supreme Court decisions that Sharon identified earlier, saying that the government cannot prohibit false speech, um, that would suggest that the government could not punish false statements in political ads. And yet they are putting pressure on the social media platforms to do exactly that. And the question is, does that raise a First Amendment question for the government to essentially pressure private entities to do something which the government itself cannot do? And that's, that's an interesting question. I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Um, part of the concern with the government doing it is we don't trust the government to do it. Private entities are allowed to do it. The New York Times can refuse to print whatever it doesn't want to print. And Facebook can refuse to print anything it doesn't want to print. So the question then is, is there a problem with the government encouraging or pressuring um, Facebook to exercise a, a, an authority that the government itself could not exercise? Um, that's an interesting question. I don't, have a, a, I don't have a good answer to it. One other thing to think about here, by the way, is I think it's important, is that the marketplace of ideas, the idea of free speech, in part depends upon citizens being thoughtful, knowledgeable, and responsible, and learning how to discern when information they receive is reliable and trustworthy and when it's not. And so one thing I think we need to do as a society is to educate people about the risks of reflexively relying upon whatever they see on Facebook or on Twitter or whatever on social media, that when they're reading magazines and newspapers, those entities are going to be liable if they publish certain types of information, whereas Facebook and Twitter won't be. And therefore, there's a greater reason for the, for the reader, for the viewer, to be, to be skeptical. And I think one thing we need to do is to make a really concerted effort to educate young people and older people about the dangers of social media and about being much more skeptical. Um, because right now, I think an awful lot of Americans are not skeptical, and that, that's a real problem. So I do think that, that that's another role that we can, we can put into place here that is designed to educate our citizens about how to use this information with a higher degree of skepticism than they otherwise would bring to reading the New York Times or watching NBC News. In, in that aspect, I fully uh, agree with Jeff. And I would add to that, that social media tends to place people in information silos uh, in part because they are trying to keep viewers on their sites. So if you keep clicking on left-leaning material, Facebook is gonna push you more left-leaning material. Same with Twitter. Uh, if you keep on clicking on right-leaning material, uh, Facebook will keep pushing at you uh, right-leaning material. And so you're likely to get information that confirms whatever biases you already had. And it just can make you become a little bit uh, disconnected from a shared reality, because in some ways there isn't a shared reality, including on Google. When I search something on Google, I'm going to get things and results that are tailored to who Google thinks I am, which are probably going to be slightly different than if Jeff does a, a Google search and because that is tailored to who they think Jeff is. And so even if Jeff and I search the same terms, we're gonna get spit out different information. 
And do you think there's is there is there a solution to that? I mean, are we are we maybe focusing on the wrong problem? If that's if that's truly the problem, are we you know obsessing with content moderation and speech when really part of the problem is? And I think you've talked about this in your book as well. This issue of I mean, that's a, almost like that's the filter bubble problem, or a lot of people talk use that term to talk about it. But also the micro targeting problem, where we're we're only we're in these little bubbles and we're targeted with information that's that's specific to our pre-existing um, assumptions in ways that limit our ability to have a meaningful, accurate discourse. Um, what, what, are, what can we do about that problem? I mean, one of the things is making the algorithms a little bit more transparent so that the average person understands what is being pushed at them is not all of Facebook. It is a selection of Facebook that is supposed to appeal to you. And it's going to be uh, politically skewed based on your past behavior on that website. Uh, though I would expect that if Congress ever tried to regulate the background algorithms, either of Google or Facebook or Twitter, that they would then raise a First Amendment uh, right to um, you know, push people to, towards certain different information. So I feel like the, the First Amendment has definitely been weaponized, um, especially in the context of the Roberts Supreme Court. Another possibility, again, to go back to the point about educating people, is um, educating them to demand that they be given information or, or positions or opinions on social media from different perspectives. That they should know they want to hear different sides and that they're not getting that right now. And so one way of dealing with this is either to require um, Facebook and, and Twitter and Google and so on to present people with different perspectives, not only what they want to see, but other perspectives, or at least give people the option of selecting that, of affirmatively selecting that and encouraging people, educating people that this is a better way for them to have information. And because part of the problem is most people who use social media don't know what's happening. They don't actually even realize that they're getting a totally distorted position based upon what they've looked at in the past. And they need to be educated about that. And either law could require that that be done, as I described, or at the very least, we could educate people to select that they receive different perspectives. Right now, I think most people who use social media are not even aware of that. Yeah, I, have a, I have an audience question, which I think goes back, back to a point that you made earlier, Jeff, about possibly whether or not there should be some sort of nonpartisan entity determining what what is acceptable and what is not acceptable content that takes the that takes the onus somehow out off the government but is, is so it's independent from the government um, and what how would you who would be part of that agency how would it be designed could you do that in a way that doesn't also somehow implicate the first amendment at least the first amendment as we know it well, I think if we're, if we're talking now about uh, being able to punish people for making false statements on social media in the political realm or whatever, uh, that that first of all would require the Supreme Court to modify its doctrine. They would have to change their Alvarez precedent and allow that to happen, which given the current court may or may not happen, but seems unlikely. Um, but that would be the first challenge. But the second part of it, I think, then would be, as you say, how do you decide who has the power to do this? And, you know, I could imagine something in which you would basically have um, a commission appointed where members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, each appoint five people. And then those 10 people have to pick the members of the commission and they have to agree unanimously on who's going to be on the commission. I mean, you now they may they may have, may find nobody that may not work, but the idea is to find a mechanism by which we can get people who both sides trust, and that that should be possible in our society, but it may not be. But that's one way of trying to go about it. 
Sarah, what do you think? Um, hmm. <laughs> How to solve the mess we're in. It, it's, a, it's a conundrum. I, I feel like the incentives for our big social media giants uh, are just in the wrong place. Uh, they're incentivized, say on YouTube, to, to give you more extreme content because the extreme content is going to get an, an emotional response and, and keep you on the platform. And I don't think that that incentive is the right one. Um, and I'm not sure how we make facts uh, free and accessible because right now lies are the things that are free. And you have to pay for good information, whether it's you know subscribing to the New York Times or the Post, uh, and at some point that makes it much easier for those who have a tendency for mendacity to win the argument, or at least win the the war over people's minds. And so I am, I'm. I'm torn about how you incentivize Facebook to privilege truth over the the lies. Uh, and but I think we, we've got to figure this out sooner rather than later. Um, it's uh, I feel like we are so on a precipice here. Um, and I think it'll be very interesting to see what happens in a week with the election and what happens likely in the weeks following the election, where we're all going to have to have a lot of patience because counting absentee ballots is going to take longer than we're used to. And I think we're going to have that information storm of people claiming victory when the totals aren't in. Yes, I think this is going to be um, the next week, month is going, hopefully it's not a whole month, but I think the next, the next week plus is going to be a, certainly going to be a challenging time um, for, for everyone on, on every count, but, um, but, but certainly raises a whole set of questions about what information gets disseminated by whom and, and who, and at what point is there um, a decision to, to, to declare victory among other things as well. Um, and what do the, what do the social media companies do with that? Um, so I think we've got a lot to, to witness over the next, next week. I want to, um, I'm trying to be respectful of everybody's time and we have another panel as well. So I want to give both of you a chance to, to provide any, any closing thoughts as well. Um, and really thank you for your time. Thanks. Sure. Do you want to go first or second? Um, I'll go second. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I do think that we face along many dimensions at the moment, a potential crisis in our democracy and uh, social media is a part of it. Um, there are other elements, obviously, as well, um, but social media is a part of it. And um, if we are going to be a well-functioning democracy going down the road, uh, we have to figure out how to make social media a positive contributor to our democracy. Right now, it's not clear that's the case. And there are lots of reasons to argue that it's the opposite. Um, and we also have to do that, though, in a way that doesn't um, give the government undue power to manipulate social media, because that, in my view, would make things even worse. So figuring out how to both fix the current problem without making it worse in ways we're not thinking about is one of the great challenges for the future. I would agree with all of that. Um, I guess I would say that as a campaign finance lawyer, uh, this is on track to be the most expensive federal election in American history. Uh, it probably will clock in around $11 billion. All of that money is being spent to influence your vote. I would encourage everyone who's watching this vote. If you can vote early, if you have an absentee ballot in your possession, I would say drive it to a ballot official balloting box. Um, don't rely on the U.S. Postal Service uh, to get your ballot in. And if all else fails, vote in person on Election Day. And 
bring a lunch, uh, some water, <laughs> and a comfortable chair because it could take a while. But the democracy really, really needs you. Um, please vote. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Huge thanks to both of you um, and and for really thoughtful comments. We could talk about this for hours. So I feel like we only, I mean, we scratched barely, barely the surface. So I really appreciate your time and your thoughts. Um, so please, um, huge thanks. And we are now going to turn to um, our next and final panel um, with Neil Richards and Daphne Keller. Thank you. Hi, Daphne. Hi, Jen. So give Neil one more second to, to join. Um, as, as Neil is joining, um, I will do um, very brief introductions because we have a very short amount of time to talk about critically important issues. Um, Daphne is, um, is a um, friend and a amazing scholar and thinker um, at Stanford, where she runs um, a platform accountability program at the at CIS, which um, um, I encourage everyone to, to follow her work and to read her writing because she's really a brilliant thinker in this area and someone that um, I learn from every time I hear her speak or read her work. Um, so thank you for joining us. And Neil, who um, I still I'm here, yeah, is here, but is showing up as a purple. Um, it, it'll be fine in one second, second. Hang on. With, a, with a pink line through it. Um, Neil Richards um, is a professor at Washington U at St. Louis, um, where he teaches and writes on the First Amendment. Um, he wrote, um, if any of you haven't read his book, Intellectual Privacy, um, I urge you to run to the bookstore and buy it now. It really is a fabulous book. Um, and he's working on yet another book, which I can't wait to read. So thank you, uh, both of you. Huge thanks for joining us um, and giving us some of your time. Um, so I'm going to start with the big framing question that I began with um, last time, which is, do we need to rethink our First Amendment? We are in a world in which um, the marketplace of ideas um, seems to be rewarding, as we just heard, the most extremist speech, the most racist speech, lies, misinformation, disinformation, and truth is, is getting lost in the noise. Um, and does that mean that, that we got it wrong, that we, that we you know, this, this kind of extraordinary First Amendment that we have in the, first, in the United States is, is both an anomaly compared to the rest of the world, and maybe, maybe it's the wrong approach? What do you think, Camille? Well, I, I, th that's a great question. Um, and uh, first of all, Thank you for having me here. Uh, it's it's great to be here with with you and Daphne, um, and and following on from uh, Jeff and CR. I also want to say hello to some of my students who are who are in the audience, uh, hopefully paying attention and, and enjoying themselves. I think the the I, I don't mean to question the premise of our entire webinar here, but but maybe I will. When we say the First Amendment, I think we have to be clear what we mean. Um, because very often when, we, when, you know, the first time it can mean, uh, you know, the however many words of constitutional text that were ratified in 1789, it, it, more commonly it, it means um, that text as interpreted by the Supreme Court and the lower federal courts over the last 200 plus years. Um, but I think the way we've been using it today is, is much more broad than that, right? To, to encompass what, what Thomas Emerson called before the internet, but I think that the, the phrase holds today, our system of free expression, right? The, the, the system by which uh, the system of, of, of institutions and, and legal rules and companies and speakers and economics and culture and social norms by which people in our democracy uh, express themselves and, and by which they uh, disagree with each other, hopefully in in, in reasoned, and, but but most essentially in in nonviolent ways, and so from from looking at the broadest perspective, I, I think we do need to to rethink the way in which we talk about expression, the the way we the way we think about free expression and our democracy and and the relationships between the two, and the ways in which the uh, 
the law applies to to some of these these areas. But but I think we should always be thinking about that, right? That the what we tend to think of as right the, the First Amendment um, is really a product of the twentieth century in response to mass media of newspapers and radio and, and television. And I think that the system that we that we have, the jurisprudence that we have is a, is a, is a set of legal accommodations to institutional and political realities um, from the problems of democracy in, in the Industrial Revolution. And I think we need to continually readjust that system, but particularly readjust it to deal with some of the, the disruptive changes of the information revolution. And I'll, I'll stop there and let Daphne talk because we've, we've got lots to say. Well, I was so relieved that Jen asked you that question first, Neil, <laughs> because I, I, you know, I, in a way, I, I feel like this is above my pay grade, right? Like I, um, all societies set rules, all legal systems set rules, balancing free expression and access to information goals against other goals, like uh, human dignity, you know, protection of reputation, privacy, societal safety, et cetera. Um, and the question of what those rules should be, I agree with Neil is, you know, is driven by the, I think what Larry Lessig would call like the architectural constraints of the time. You know, how is the marketplace of ideas affected by the fact that we are transmitting uh, information over Twitter or Facebook or, or Zoom, um, rather than receiving information more passively from broadcast and, you know, do, should the rules evolve in light of some changes in the marketplace of ideas driven by this change in the physical infrastructure of, of how it is that we share them? Um, you know, this is a huge question, <laughs> but the, the question I tend to focus more on um, is one that, that came up in, in the last panel quite a bit and, and which I addressed in my Who Do You Sue article, which is the sort of, well, but what do you do if the enforcers of the rules for the most part aren't government anyway? You know, if these things that used to be government functions like operating the public square or operating the postal service or operating the currency system, um, more and more are, are done by private companies and they're not subject to the constraints of the first amendment and they're not subject to the constraints of the fourth amendment. Um, and they have unprecedented abilities to um, you know, to, to carry out surveillance or to detect what we're saying and automatically respond to it and automatically silence people, you know, that is such a massive change. Um, and, and it so deeply challenges our thinking about the ways that we protect individual rights because we're used to protecting them from governments and we don't have a mechanism to really to, to weigh them against um, private power like that. Um, so, so I think the larger question has to do with the increasing role of, of private actors who are not subject to First Amendment constraints the way the government is. Yes, I mean, I, I think that that, I mean, completely agree, Daphne, that I mean, that is that is where the, the problems are arising and that's where the contestation is arising. Um, and as we talked about in the last panel, we are, we are speaking as the CEOs of Google Facebook and Twitter are also being called before Congress to talk about um, whether or not the laws that govern their platforms need an update to respond to all of the harms and perceived harms that are being disseminated online. But there's an interesting connection there, right? Between what, what can Congress do and what can the government do to regulate these platforms given First Amendment limitations? And, both as a constitutional matter and then as a normative matter, what should be done. Um, and so, Neil, I'll, I'll turn to you and ask you a question that um, one of my students asked the other day, which I found really interesting, is, which is, to what extent does either the, the First Amendment or First Amendment values require something like Section 230 as a means of, um, of ensuring that there is a free marketplace of ideas, even if they're controlled by third parties, private actors. Right, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I tend to agree with, with Jeff on this, that um, the, the, there's certainly, right, so, so the, the, the modern First Amendment in the United States comes about as a result of New York Times versus Sullivan, which places limitations on the ability of the state to use its tort system to, to menace free expression. Um, 
whether we use a marketplace of ideas metaphor or, or, or something more closely tied to self-governance, I, I think that, that that's what, where orthodox First Amendment law is coming from. I, I, I don't think that Section 230 is constitutionally required. Let me, let me, let me say that. I, I think the, 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 the interesting history of, of Section 230 was it was it's the rump piece. It's sort of what was left behind um, the, the, the greatest censorship bill in American history since the Sedition Act of 1798, right? The Communications Decency Act of, of, uh, of, of 1996. The, the decency was about driving pornography off the internet and making the internet fit for children. The Supreme Court struck that down in, 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 the, in, the, in the Reno case. Um, I think the, the First Amendment, d- democracy, self-government, or system of free expression could function perfectly well Without Section Two Thirty, I think Daphne may may, the, may be horrified by by this, um, and I, I'm looking forward to talking about that. Uh, but there are baseline um, tort rules, as Jeff pointed out, for for publishers and 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 for authors. Um, I, I think, though, I, I want to agree with something that, that Daphne said, which is that as we make these adjustments to uh, to a sort of a, a digital First Amendment, we have to be aware of, of, of what's happening. And, and the, the increasing importance of, of private power um, is something that we have to reckon with and we have to maybe take advantage of, but certainly deal with some of the consequences of it. So, so I think we don't need to have 230 as 230. I think we need to, certainly need to have something which recognizes and, and, and checks and enhances appropriately in, in pursuit of the broader goals, um, the fact that so much of our expression is being uh, permitted, mediated, uh, controlled, manipulated by um, largely unaccountable private companies that may have very thin views of, of the First Amendment as a primary goal and what they're doing and may have much broad, thicker views of, of engagement and profitability first and foremost. So uh, I would say the US has not very well developed First Amendment law on this because we have lived most of the internet era uh, in an age of statutes. You know, CDA 230 and the DMCA for copyright have really occupied almost all of the field and left it so that American courts haven't had to think about what the First Amendment might require in a very long time. But they used to think about it. You know, there are 20th century cases about liability for booksellers, for example. Smith v. California said you can't hold a bookseller strictly liable because otherwise he'll have this incentive to go out and take way too many books off the shelf. And that will, um, you know, hurt the rights of authors and of readers. Um, uh, Bantam Books also was basically an intermediary liability case about booksellers. Uh, New York Times v. Sullivan, which Neil mentioned, was also an intermediary liability case. It was about civil rights activists in the South placing an ad in the New York Times. And it was that ad, not a piece of journalism, that, that was alleged to be defamatory. And part of the court's analysis was like, look, we want speakers who don't otherwise have access to a printing press to be able to, you know, to use the New York Times as their platform. This is one of the reasons not to have overly burdensome legal responsibilities. Um, so, you know, we know that there is a First Amendment limit that is specific to um, to intermediaries, to, you know, to, to things like booksellers. And in, in terms of applying that to internet companies, there's a really interesting case, district court case called CDTV Pappert um, that used uh, you know, pre-internet First Amendment law to strike down a law that uh, targeted ISPs, uh, saying it wasn't narrowly tailored enough. It didn't adequately anticipate the incentives that they have to go overboard and remove too much. Um, if you look outside the US though, the international human rights sources are incredibly sophisticated on this because the rest of the world has been dealing with it for the past 20 years. So if you look at things like reports from David Kay, the free expression, UN free expression rapporteur, um, you know, they talk about things like having courts be the ones to decide what is illegal. Or if there are kinds of content where it's so urgent that you don't want to go through a court, you want to go straight to the platform and say, hey, you decide, take this down. Having ways to account for the inevitable abuse that notice and takedown systems like that attract, um, like notifying the accused speaker, letting them uh, 
respond and defend themselves, having penalties for bad faith accusations. So well, we, we know a lot about what the mechanisms might be that would sort of reduce the speech harms in a, a world without 230. Um, what I worry about most is that Congress will do something like literally just cross 230 out or replace it with a fuzzy standard like the reasonableness um, standard that Daniel Citron and Ben Wittes have proposed. Um, and I think that would leave a, you know, even though 230 itself, the literal words are not constitutionally required, I think striking it out and leaving everybody to litigate to a better solution um, would be catastrophic. You know, first of all, small platforms can't afford to do that. So there's a big anti-competitive impact. Uh, notably, the 230 hearing today only has Google, Twitter, and Facebook. I hope if they pass a law based on what those guys say, it only applies to Google, Twitter, and Facebook and not the tens of thousands of other entities that depend on CDA 230. So th there's a competitive problem. And then of course, there's a speech problem, you know, was kind of like we saw after, after SESTA-FOSTA uh, platform shutting down forums entirely or erring on the side of taking down lawful speech because they're afraid of liability. Um, and I think those are problems that, you know, the corrective mechanism if you're going to have platform liability is this operational stuff like counter notice and penalties for, you know, bad faith accusations and so forth. And you'll, you'll never arrive at that through litigating to a new standard in a CDA 230 list world or in a, a world with a reasonableness standard because the parties in the litigation, they're not gonna raise that, <laughs> you know, like neither the plaintiff who's been injured by online content nor the platform who wants to say, hey, what I did is reasonable are going to say, oh, hey, and also a good system would be, you know, something like what the UN Free Expression Rapporteur has been proposing or something like what the PACT Act in Congress now is proposing. Um, so, you know, while 230 itself, of course, is not literally required by the First Amendment, there is a really important function for legislative protection that I don't think we would arrive at through litigation of First Amendment questions. Right. So, so there was there's a ton in what you just said, Daphne. Um, so I just want to sorry. <laughs> no, it's fabulous. I just want to break down a little bit of it. So, so one hugely important point about the fact that Section 230 does not just protect Twitter, Facebook, and Google. Section 230 has huge implications for a range of smaller content providers and really internet companies up and down the internet stack, not even just content providers. Um, and so and like retailers, you know, the New York Times for its comments section, it, it's such a huge breadth of, of actors. Right. So as we think about reforms to Section 230, and as Congress thinks about reforms to Section 230, I think it's agree wholeheartedly with your point that it's critically important that the full range of perspectives and implications get considered. Um, you talked about SESTA, FOSTA, just for listeners who might not be as in the weeds as, as Daphne, as SESTA, FOSTA was the one amendment to Section 230 that took place since its enactment. And it basically was designed to deal with the problem of sex trafficking um, online um, and impose liability um, or, or made explicit um, what some argued already was the case, but made explicit that platforms could be held liable for, among other things, um, facilitation of criminal um, sex offenses on their site. And it led in some cases to concerns about liability by platforms, including a decision by Craigslist to take down its personal ads altogether because of fears that they would be exposed to liability for um, ads that were used for, for sexual solicitation of some sort or another. Um, and so it's often used as an example of what sounds good on paper often has unintended consequences. Um, and so um, is there, is, but this raises the really important question, is there a way to reform Section 230 that gets at some of the most egregious harms without creating this whole host of unintended consequences. Um, and you mentioned the PACT Act, I think with some suggestion that you that you are supportive of the PACT Act. And, and I think some of your prior writing has suggested that as well. It'd be great to hear just a, a little bit more about why that's the case and what, what are the positive aspects of that particular provision provision that have been drafted. Well, I'm, I'm supportive of the approach of the PACT Act. As it stands right now, you know, it's like a 
30 page PDF or something and it's dense with operational detail about how they want um, content moderation to work. And a lot of that operational detail is just wrong. You know, like people who work in trust and safety um, will look at it and be like, wait, <laughs> you know, that will make things worse for users. You know, that's not how it works. But the what I like about it and what makes it better than the literally 20 other bills <laughs> in Congress about this right now, um, is that it's the only one that is really focused on, on the mechanics, on the operational detail of what platforms are really going to do in response to this law. And so it sets out step by step, like, you know, bring the platform a court order and then they do this, or, you know, if they are doing content moderation, enforcing their own discretionary policies, then there's the, you know, this kind of transparency and this kind of disclosures they have to make and this kind of appeals. Um, and that I think is, that's the only way to regulate content moderation at scale. You know, it's more like regulating um, emissions or food safety or, you know, some other big complex system um, with huge consequences for lots and lots of people um, is to look at how that system is really going to work. You want people who are emissions experts doing environmental regulation. You want people who are finance experts doing tax regulation. You don't want to set out some vague words that sound good or, or do what um, Senator Eshoo did recently and what I think is a really well-intentioned effort, but you know, she's proposing that there should be new liability based on laws drafted in 1871. <laughs> You know, just take something from 1871 and make it apply to contemporary internet platforms. Like that is a recipe for unintended consequences. Um, the social and, telegraph scene was fantastic, though. In like the, 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 the <laughs> it really was. Some, some of those Morse code memes were amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that was a Morse code meme. I want, to, I want to turn to you and ask you a question that comes out from some of what just Stephanie said and some from the last panel as well, which is this idea that transparency is part of the solution, that, that, that what we need is better transparency, listeners need to be informed, they need to know that they're basically being pushed in one direction or another. And I think at the heart of that is this assumption that, like, and at the heart of our entire rights structure, including the First Amendment, is this assumption of this rational actor making independent choice and independent decisions. And I think one of the questions that gets often raised by our digital world is a suggestion that, that maybe we are less, we, are, we, have, we are less cognitively independent as all of this assumes. Mm -hmm. um, and that there isn't this rational listener um, that we can kind of push better, more transparency to, more truth to, and that will just solve the problem. What do you what do you think about that? And if that's true, what does that do to like the underpinnings of at least a key component of not just the First Amendment, but our, to some extent our right structure in general, which all to a large extent is premised on this rational actor model theory? Who do you want to answer that? That was to you, Neil. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, so my as as the the, the other panelists know, my, my other field is privacy law and. The, the idea that, that notice solves problems in privacy has been a epic and catastrophic failure almost entirely across the board. And so I, I think it's important to make, as, as Daphne suggested with, with the, the, the devil is in the details in 230 reform, it's important for us to have systems of free expression or, or legal rules that actually bear some resemblance to reality rather than to what our ideology might want it to be. Um, that's perhaps a, a good lesson for this week in general. Um, the, and I think when it comes to human minds, right, that human minds are less rational than um, sort of the classic liberal model suggests, um, but they're not totally irrational, right? That we are capable of, of rational thought when we have education, when we have uh, resources, when we have uh, opportunities to reflect and, and to think, but when we're, we're constantly being bombarded by information um, that, is, that has been scientifically tested through A-B testing to, to make us act in particular ways, when we're constantly bombarded with, with misinformation in environments that have been designed 
deploying behavioral science in order to make us more amenable to, to, to click and to be engaged and to be outraged and, and to, to spend our time and thus make money for advertising supported services. I think, I think it's really hard. So I don't think the answer is just more notice. Um, I think we need to try and find ways to preserve spaces and, and opportunities for for public deliberation, for, for human deliberation, particularly around the more important decisions that we have to make, like like what kind of a society we want to live in and, and who should who should vote for us, who we should vote for, sorry, um, as, our, as our representatives to make policy for us. So I'm mindful that we're not perfectly rational, but human history suggests that human beings are, are not perfectly rational, right? D democracies make really bad decisions. It's just that, that, that autocracies and, and, and kleptocracies and, and, and countries that are run like uh, closely held corporations make even worse decisions uh, and worse decisions for ordinary people. So, so I think in, t in terms of what should we do, I think transparency is, is important, right? There needs to be, transparency for individuals if they're so motivated, but also um, uh, public minded civic groups and, and government regulators to see what's going on. But transparency alone is, is, is not going to, is, is not going to work just because we human beings are often irrational, frequently busy, and we're not using the internet. We're not using these platforms necessarily to make weighty political decisions. We want to, you know, show vacation pictures and, and, and see how our friends' children are, are, are growing or, or just connect and engage with people. And, and I think it's a great tragedy um, that platforms like Facebook and Google and, and Twitter and others, I think Daphne's exactly right, there's not just four companies in the world, have not only come to be thought of as the, to use that dreadful expression from Packingham, the digital public square, um, but that they, are that that's okay that that i think we need to to the extent we can to separate um democratic deliberation from the comment sections of of, of newspapers and uh the, what passes for reasoned political debate on um on, on facebook and twitter because m most of it's pretty awful and and i think by conflating the commercial and the political in that way, we just have a mess where, where everything is worse. So Jen, I think your question about intellectual autonomy here is, is such a deep one. And, and it's one, I mean, this is in large part what Neil's book is about. So, you know, I, I would happily just listen to Neil talk about this a lot more. Um, but I, I think, you know, this came up on the last panel too, that this idea that sort of um, we're all clicking uh, in hopes of like dopamine hits um, and uh, the ad incentives for the platforms cause them to feed us more and more polarizing material. And I think there's both something to that and, and the story is more complicated. You know, the, the, the something to it is I definitely think, and, and I think there's like neuroscience behind this, like when you react really fast to something, you are not reacting with the better and more thoughtful part of your brain. You know, you're reacting with the part that stares at the accident or grabs the candy bar at the checkout aisle. Um, and, and you're not, you know, you're making the choices that your id would make, but not that your ego or super ego would make, if you want to put it in, in Freudian terms. Um, and so, you know, having algorithms that are optimized to respond to that um, is a problem. On the other hand, the sort of economic part of this story that because they are, um, make money through ads, all platforms will ever do is respond to the clicking that you do with your id. Um, I, I don't, I, th I think that's oversimplified. I mean, for one thing, when people do that for too long and feel icky, then they leave platforms, you know, <laughs> or, you know, they, the polarizing people drive away people who are an important economic source for the platform. So I, I, I think the economic part of the story ne needs more examination. But the, the deep, deep question, I think, is like, what, what should we do about that? You know, if, if algorithms are giving people what they appear to want based on their behavior, when do we override that and say, no bad user, you're wanting the wrong thing. 
you know, we're going to take away this candy and make you eat vegetables now. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a liberal, I'm up for that kind of paternalism, you know, to some degree, but um, you know, who, who decides, <laughs> who, who decides which, what the vegetables are and when they're going to be mandated. Um, so, so I think framing the question like that kind of forces us into this really difficult question about control over information and, you know, what information is healthy and, and who decides what that is. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think this came up in the last panel too about this question of who decides. And there's about there's there's two parts of that: who decides and who decides what as well. And so I think, you know, as the question about the alg algorithmic um, incentives and the the ways in which you know, all the things that, that that both you and Neil just mentioned about the dopamine um, reactions raises a question: you know, are we I mean, we have two ways of, we have a variety of ways of tackling this problem. One is to focus explicitly on content and asking platforms to do more and more and regulate what content is applying. Another piece of it is looking at, as we were just talking about now, the business models and thinking about whether there's ways to incentivize, if not radical overhaul, at least minor changes in the ways that interactions happen online that would have the side effect of dealing with some of the harmful content online, like misinformation and disinformation. And in that regard, I think some of, you know, I'm curious as to what the thoughts are about what Twitter's done recently with, which is basically like forcing people to like take a breath before they retweet. So are you sure you want to retweet this? That kind of like extra step? Does that, is that the kind of, you know, kind of creative solution where we're not asking platforms to be a speech police? So we're not doing what was suggested in the last panel, creating a new, commission that would itself be the speech police, but maybe maybe we need to kind of think out of the box and think creatively about other solutions as well. What do you think about the Twitter's kind of checking? I, I, I like the idea of, of deliberation. I mean, I, I think the, we, we all want whatever, we, we all want whatever our, I guess we're being Freudian today, Daphne, whatever our it desires, and we want it immediately. Um, but but if we if we did that all the time, right, we would have we would have horrible lives um, and we would have an even worse society. Um, and I think opportunities for reflection, opportunities for deliberation, opportunities, as was suggested in the last panel, for exposure uh, to um, to ideas we we might find challenging or, or or disagree with right basically you know i'm i'm we're I'm, we're professors right so i'm describing the classical liberal arts curriculum um which i think is a really really good thing e even as uh, humanities enrollments decline in favor of of stem um in in many universities around the world i would say that the twitter's decision to impose deliberation on, on retweeting is a good thing i would say that twitter's uh decision to eliminate or, or restrict political advertising because of the risks of misinformation that that carries it in its environment is, is a good thing. But that creates two problems of its own. One, it shows the tremendous power that design has over our decisions. Um, and it shows how much of that power over design is vested in, in private entities. That's the first problem. Second one is one that Daphne mentioned earlier. We don't have a good story for dealing with private power in our constitutional tradition, uh, right? We've, we've got stories for dealing with government power going all the way back to Magna Carta in 1215, right? 805 years of working on the problem of government power. Um, but we don't have a good set of cultural stories, of narratives, of scripts, of, of, of movies, of, of literature, of books that explain why private power particularly private corporate power can be problematic to human freedom and, and, and human flourishing. And while we're talking in systems terms, we have a, a stacked federal judiciary up to it, including the Supreme Court that has been, that has been selected by this administration, um, primarily on ideo ideology ahead of, ahead of talent or judging. There are many very good judges who this administration has has appointed. Um, but there's an ideological skew and that ideological skew first and foremost tends to prioritize private power, corporate power um, at, the ex at the expense of, of individual liberty, often at a constitutional level. And I think increasingly operationalizing the first amendment to try and insulate those, those kinds of power, applications of power from, from the law. And I think 
that's not the First Amendment 2.0 that we want, even if we do want one. I think if we want insight into dystopias ruled by corporations, there is, there is a rich science fiction literature that, that can help us think that through. Um, but but I overall, I agree with Neil. And absolutely, you know, our legal culture doesn't have mechanisms for um, for for thinking about this, and and it leads to really strange outcomes where the um, discretion of private platforms to enforce whatever speech rules they want makes them vectors for the power of whoever has leverage over them. Um, and, you know, so one very striking example is the Zhang v. Baidu case. Baidu is China's biggest search engine. It was sued in a US court by Chinese democracy activists who said, hey, Baidu is taking down our speech and it's doing so at the behest of the Chinese government, make them stop. And the court said, actually Baidu is a corporation with its own first amendment rights to set its own editorial policy and take down whatever it wants. And so because of Baidu's first amendment rights, um, you know, cases dismissed. Uh, and, and so there the, you know, the first amendment rights of the private company become a reason that Chinese censorship rules can be exported to the United States. Um, that is a remarkable, a remarkable outcome. And, and I think probably a legally correct outcome based on Supreme Court precedent on, you know, in this area uh, and, you know, based on all of the other suits where platforms have raised this same First Amendment argument, usually in less remarkable situations. Um, and, and so I, I do think, you know, we, we need to think long and hard and, you know, theorize well about constraining the power of corporations. But I, I think also what we already have is a set of legal tools and constitutional hooks for constraining the power of governments. And so uh, the sort of short term thing we can be doing is noticing when what appears to be platform action is actually laundered state action, you know, when actually the platform is appeasing the powerful uh, based on public pressure or backroom private pressure, what Jenny referred to earlier as jawboning, you know, because those are the, the situations where at least nominally our existing legal doctrines should give us a mechanism to, to push back and, and, and to stop that kind of exercise of power. So I, yeah. I worry though that if, if we, we do accept uncritically the idea that uh, content moderation slash censorship slash editing decisions by, by platforms become uncritically First Amendment rights, then not only have we returned to the problem that Jeff mentioned in the previous panel about a rich person buying up the both of the newspapers in a major city and controlling public discourse, but we have that happening on a, on a society-wide level um, and, and not just happening broader in scope, but protected by, by, by the First Amendment um, such that it cannot be regulated and then they can control public debate about whether it should be regulated or whether the personnel in the Supreme Court should be changed. I, I'm not uncritical, I'm just resigned. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm resigned based on like, Justice Kavanaugh's opinions on this in the past, the makeup of the current court, the, you know, like I think there are a lot of reasons to think this is the legal system we have for a good long, long time to come. And it's different, you know, Poland, Germany, Brazil, Italy have all ordered platforms to reinstate content. They've sort of overridden platforms decisions. Um, but their, their horizontal application of human rights approach is very different from ours. Um, yes, and I think, I mean, one of the things that I, you know, one is a question of how much, how much freedom do platforms have to censor or to make, I mean, depending on one's view, either to censor or to make decisions, content moderation decisions consistent with their own First Amendment rights. But I think we've got this other tension as well is that both platforms have their own First Amendment rights. They're also not bound by the First Amendment vis-a-vis -vis rights of their users, yet the government can and does increasingly, not just in the US, but around the world, and Daphne, you've written about this extensively as well, put pressure on platforms to take actions that the government can't do itself. I raised this in the last panel as well, but that raises a really complex set of incentives and, 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 and questions about who is responsible and how, what are the rules that apply in that situation? We are, um, I, I can't believe we're almost out of time. This is the 
such a fascinating set of issues and there's so much to talk about, um, but I wanna give both of you an opportunity to, to say you know, a, a final word, final thoughts um, before, before we um, actually do finally run out of time. I'll say a quick thing on CDA 230, which is that uh, it is important that we are talking about this. It is not a perfect law. We should have a long, slow, careful conversation and not rush into something that will throw us into the discursive maelstrom um, you know, of either eliminating platforms discretion to take down hate speech and electoral disinformation and so forth. Uh, on the one hand, or leading them to wildly over-censor everything on the other. Um, so take it slow. And I'm gonna say something very broad, which is that um, we've been here before in a, in, a, in, in a sense, right? History doesn't repeat itself, right, but it rhymes. And in the industrial revolution, we found that our system of, of law for dealing with corporate power in the workplace uh, what was was completely inadequate. We learned that our our, our system for dealing with with mass media was was completely inadequate, and we and we developed a lot of legal tools about workplace safety and, and workplace equality and and wages and hours and and the FCC and the, the regulation of a of a system that was deeply destabilizing. And of course, the the informational system of the industrial revolution. Um, also led to demagoguery and fascism and, and lots of other horrific problems, right? And I think the information revolution is just as destabilizing as the industrial revolution was. Um, I think we're seeing similar levels of, of wealth inequality and, and access inequality. I think we're seeing similar challenges to our, to our legal institutions. And I think what we need is, is something that is, that is big and that is, and that is bold and that is Daphne is exactly right, and is careful, and is nuanced, and is focused on making people's lives better. But but I, I do think that the that the First Amendment, our system of free expression, is going to have to evolve. Um, but I think I'll I'll end where I began, which is that um, what we think of as the the First Amendment for all time was a set of institutional arrangements to the Industrial Revolution and to mass media, and I think we got it on the whole in the United States more or less right. Um, and I think we have a, a huge set of challenges in front of us, um, including a resistant judiciary. Um, but I'm but I'm hopeful. Um, this is an interesting week in American history to, to be making these predictions. But I, I will say that I that I remain hopeful um, that we can work together to get this right to, to come up with a set of rules that ensures that as a democracy we make the better decisions rather than the worst decisions most of the time, and we provide an opportunity for people to express themselves and to promote art and culture um, and, and good governance. So I love ending on a note of optimism. I think we all need that at this particular moment. So thank you for that, Neil. Um, and huge thanks to both Daphne and Neil for your time today. As a reminder, this is part of an ongoing free speech project, a collaboration between the Tech Law and Security Program where I work at American University and Future Tense, which is itself a collaboration of Slate New America and Arizona State University. Thank you to New America for hosting this. Um, please check out um, Future Tense's website to see a range um, of articles on this issue, including a fabulous article by Daphne about Section 230 and the Department of Justice's recent proposals and a really fantastic um, Q&A with um, Neil Richards um, that was just posted, I believe, yesterday. So please check us out. Thanks for joining us and um, thank you again, Daphne and Neil. Thank you, Jen. Thank you so much.